My dear friends, I suppose there are a lot of different terms and words that you could use to describe kind of the tendencies or the mood of our times, uh, but I can't help but think that humility is not one of them. Uh, well, the scriptures have teaching on that, and we're going to hear some of that teaching as it comes before us uh, in the Bible readings that are appointed for this 17th Sunday after Trinity, and we're wishing you uh, God's blessing and the pouring out of his Holy Spirit uh, as we gather uh, online for this hour of worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Now let's pray. Lord, we implore you, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the evil one, and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this now, which is the 17th Sunday after Trinity, is recorded in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25. 
Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen do not hastily bring into court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself, and do not reveal another's secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you, and your ill repute have no end. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver, like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is the faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke in the 14th chapter. And this reading also serves as the basis for the preaching today. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Now in the words of the Nicene Creed, we'll confess our holy faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
May God pour out upon every one of you people much grace and peace in the knowledge of him and of his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. As I mentioned a minute ago, the text to which we give attention today is the Holy Gospel that was read already uh, from St. Luke in the 14th chapter. And that Gospel uh, concludes with these words of Jesus, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now let's pray. Holy Spirit, come and shine on our souls with beams divine, issuing from your radiance bright. Come, O Father of the poor, ever bounteous of your store, come, our hearts unfailing light. Amen. In Christ, who is a Lord for the humble and the lowly, my dear and treasured brothers and sisters, all of you, there is a certain kind of pride which can seem honorable and even a little bit touching. When a parent, for example, is proud of a disabled child who didn't give up despite the disability and worked really hard to overcome terrible hurdles, or let's say when a soldier feels pride in his or her country and for that reason tried to be all the more conscientious. That's a kind of pride that seems more like deep gratitude and there's no need to be ashamed of that. When the Bible says God opposes the proud, it's not describing that grateful kind of pride. It means that other kind of pride that may make you think about a person, he's so full of himself. That's often the problem, isn't it? The pride that grows there out of a big inflated ego where I get really impressed with myself and I figure that other people ought to be just as impressed with me too. We've all seen that, I guess, in some person or persons that we have come to know along life's way. And to be honest, it can be kind of nauseating. And you may see it sometimes in yourself if you're perfectly honest. It's a problem, that brand of pride is, and Jesus is teaching on that subject in the Gospel reading in front of us today in a way that's kind of short on words, but it's very long on wisdom. He makes a few valuable things clear on the problem with pride. The first is that pride can turn you deaf to God's words. The second is that pride can tear at the tie that needs to be there between you and other people. And the third thing is that pride can be healed and helped by Jesus himself. So anyway, there was this day when he got invited to dinner. And it says, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Each one of those facts is important to remember. It was a Sabbath. The host and a great many of the guests assembled around that host were Pharisees and they were watching Jesus. He didn't get invited because they wanted to honor him particularly, or because they were that sincerely interested in what he might teach them. He was being watched because they already had come to conclusions about him. He was being watched because they wanted to set a trap for him. So all of a sudden there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. I'm told that's a medical condition where your body retained water and swelled and caused many of your features, you know, to get sort of distended and uh, distorted and made you look rather grotesque. And this made you, in addition to all of that, what they called religiously unclean. In other words, unacceptable in the minds of pious guys like the Pharisees. I actually don't think it was an accident that that guy was there that evening. It was quite likely that they brought this man there on purpose so that they could put Jesus to the test. And the test was, would Jesus heal the guy? If he did, that would be a clear violation of their tight way of understanding God's holy third commandment, uh, you know, with its teaching about resting on the Sabbath. Or on the other hand, would Jesus refuse to heal this guy and then turn away a poor sufferer without mercy who needed help and maybe damage his own popularity there in town? This is where the sick pride was already kicking in. You got religious leaders here 
who are just slobbering over the chance to make Jesus look bad. They wanted to use their idea of the Sabbath law and the third command to prove he is wrong and we are right. He's a no good lawbreaker and we are holy men. I told you that one problem with pride is this. Pride can make you deaf to God's words. The pride of these Pharisees was doing exactly that to them. They didn't really ponder very deeply the Lord's intention in the Sabbath day. God had indeed set aside that day to rest from one's regular stressful work, a day when everybody would rest so that we'd all be free, you know, to come together and hear the Lord's word being read and taught, a day when that word would be able to comfort you with God's mercy towards sinners, <laughs> and where you would be able then to go forth into another work week refreshed and, and, and try to find ways to honor God's mercy by showing love toward other people, like this sick guy. Pride made them blind and deaf to all of that. No, the vital thing is to show how Jesus is wrong and how we are right, how Jesus is bad and how we are holy. Well, Jesus, Jesus didn't even wait for them to put him to the test. He seized the initiatives, and he asked the Pharisees and the experts of the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And all of a sudden, these guys, who thought they had the truth by the tail, couldn't answer. Because deep down, they knew that God would want them to help a guy like that. And deep down, they must have known if one of their own farm animals would fall into a well, they wouldn't just ignore that just because it's a Sabbath and leave a poor creature terrified and groaning in a predicament like that. Well, if it's all right for a pious person on the Sabbath to rescue an animal in trouble, is it wrong on the Sabbath to rescue a man who happens to be in trouble? They invited Jesus, it's really something, to this dinner to lure him into a trap. And now all of a sudden, he's turned the tables and they're the ones that are caught with the result that they can't manage to say anything. This wasn't the last time that people got tempted by pride. And this particular Pharisee story makes quite clear, it's not just a problem for unbelievers. Religious people are tempted badly by pride. I have to say, I've given in to that temptation in my own life more times than I care to remember. And I've seen it in other believers. In our time, uh, of course, uh, we don't uh, you know, quibble too much about Sabbath rules. But I've seen religious people get into disagreements with another believer who really seem to take total delight in proving the other person wrong and proving themselves right. They didn't even realize how they were often trampling all over God's words in the process to prove themselves right, sometimes willingly spreading gossip or putting the other person on the spot, you know, out in public, let's say in a meeting or something like that in front of other people in order to humiliate that brother or sister because pride dictated, I'm right, and other people need to know that I'm right. The pride of the pious looking people at that dinner party made them deaf to God's words and to what God really was trying to achieve in the Sabbath. And the pride of Christian people today, and be people like you and me, can make us deaf to God's words when the real holy thing would be to dig deeper into those words and in humility to let those words have their way. The little confrontation that happened between Jesus and the Pharisees at that dinner is only part of what this gospel is teaching you about pride. The second thing is that pride can really tear at the bond that is there between you and others. See, after this little showdown involving the sick man whom Jesus healed, it was time to go into dinner. And Luke tells us, when Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to the wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. So you can picture it. All these holy looking types begin entering the dining room. And many of them are pushing themselves forward and trying to grab a prominent spot, maybe close to the host up toward the front of the room before some other guest, you know, crowds in there and gets to the spot before you do. It should not be hard at all to imagine the effect that that kind of thing must have had on people's relationships in that dining room. 
Maybe nobody's going to say anything about it, of course, overtly. But the ones who got to those prime spots may be thinking in a rather smug way, well, way to go, you know. I did it. I've arrived. And meanwhile, others who got nudged along the way and maybe were upstaged could well have felt rather stung by all of this. And that's the kind of seedbed, you know, where things like resentment and bitterness can begin to grow. Oh yes, afterwards people might still go through the outward motions of politeness, but on the inside, the friendliness that ought to be there has gotten torn and strained. To be sure, there are paces of honor and prominence in the world, and God himself has actually ordered it so. Our queen, for example, who has given herself in service to our Commonwealth countries for over 60 years, since before I was ever born. She deserved a singular place of honor. At that banquet in Toronto a number of years ago where I was an invited guest, I didn't deserve that spot. Or if you're invited, let's say, to the wedding of a young couple by the brides or the groom's parents, and you think of all the effort and all the love that that father and mother, uh, you know, invested in rearing those young people. Of course, the parental seats of honor belong to them and not to you. Snatch places of honor for yourself, and Jesus describes here what can happen. A person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat, and then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. Far better, Jesus says, to remain modest and lowly and ready to honor other people. And if any honors are to come to you, to let them come in God's way and in his time. Take the lowest place, the Lord said, so that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place, and then you'll be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. The book of Proverbs talks a lot like that too. It says, let another person praise you and not your own mouth, an outsider, and not your own lips. That sort of humility, waiting on God for recognition, and then accepting it as a gift from him when it does come, that actually can affect your relationship to other people in a really heartwarming way. It really can warm their hearts and draw them to you. Even among unbelievers, there are few things more off-putting than arrogant, self-centered men and women. And yet on the other side of the coin, People can often be very drawn and warmed at heart, let's say, to a teacher who's very gifted and very popular, but still humbly takes time for a needy, struggling student. Or people can be drawn, let's say, to a family doctor who's obviously quite bright and very competent, but makes no particular big deal out of that, but instead is patient and understanding toward the simplest person who's under his or her care. Watch carefully how Jesus related to others at this dinner to which he was invited. We have records in the Bible, I guess you would know this, of Jesus being willing to sit down and share dinner with very crude and sinful people, you know, tax collectors and prostitutes and folks of that kind. Many times, oddly enough, they were much more receptive to him than the pious big shots were. And yet, he accepted this invitation to a Pharisee's house, willingly attended a dinner, that was full of proud and self-righteous people. Now, why would that be? It's because he loves them too. And he wants people even who despise him. And while he was there at that dinner, he was firm, yes, but he was also rather gentle in trying to show them the Lord's right way, even in the face of their insufferable pride. You don't read here, for example, that he insulted or called names or puffed himself up or cared a lot about being proven righteous for his own sake. Pride can be healed and helped by Jesus. He humbled himself to go to this dinner, even though he knew the occasion was going to be full of people uh, who were out to get him, consumed by their pride. Jesus' whole life was that way, actually. The Bible says he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Yes, all the way to death on a cross. Or as the Apostle Paul said in another place, he was rich but became poor for you in order to make you rich by his poverty. He's everything, folks. But he didn't push himself forward. 
He was willing to go down, down, down to a dinner where the big shots despised him. And then after that went down even further to a trial where liars got him condemned to death. And down even further after that to the jeers and the whipping and the bleeding and ultimately right down to the ground where they spiked him tight to a piece of wood and then hoisted it up into the air where he died looking like he had nothing to be proud of, looking like a criminal and a sinner and a loser. He didn't grab any honor for himself. He waited for his Father God to give honor to him. And the Bible says, that's why God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And that's what we're here in this service to do. We bow before him and acclaim him and adore him and by faith we stand together with the early Christians and give him the title that we're willing to offer to nobody else when we say Jesus Christ is Lord. When Jesus poured out holy blood and died for robbers and adulterers and murderers, that same blood was there to cover the sins of people who are proud in the wrong way, people who are too full of themselves, as we say, people who've been tempted to turn a deaf ear to God's words in their pride. Jesus died for them too, for the simple reason that he wants them too. If you've been one of those people, and I have to confess to my shame that on any number of occasions I've been one of them, the crucified and risen one invites you to come to him now. And he has his way of shaping men and women who come to him. He speaks the words that start to overcome that old, tired, nauseating, divisive pride. It doesn't happen all at once. People beset with pride might have to keep wrestling with it and keep repenting of it and keep renouncing it and keep clinging to Jesus for pardon and keep trying to start fresh all over again in the power of God's Holy Spirit. But when Jesus shapes you that way, he ultimately draws you closer to the Lord because all of a sudden you're closer because you realize how you need the mercy that God has to give you. And in the process, he deepens the heart ties that bind you to other people. God opposes the proud, says St. Peter in the Bible, but gives grace to the humble. And he really does. He gives grace by, <laughs> he keeps pardoning them. He keeps on moving them forward. And he gives you honors that you could never have grabbed for yourself. The honor of being called God's own redeemed, forgiven, much loved son or daughter. So may the lessons that Jesus offers from that dinner at a Pharisee's house live and breathe and bring their needed help into your life and mine. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Most merciful God, you desire everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Granted by the preaching of your good news, we may be given the wisdom that leads to salvation. By the working of your spirit, keep us attentive to all the teachings of your word. Enlighten our minds, control our wills, and purify our affections. Let your word be a light for our path that neither the pleasures nor the honors nor the pains of this life may turn away our thoughts from the fullness of life that is found only in you. Enable us in sincerity of heart to follow you, the only true God. By your word, enlighten all who are in error and doubt or temptation with a sure and certain knowledge of your truth, that even those who live in sin may be led to repentance. Show mercy and grace to all who are suffering from any distress, to those who are sick or hospitalized, to those facing death. Let them know the sure comfort of your holy word. We commit ourselves and all for whom we pray this day to your fatherly care and benediction. Be gracious to us 
and defend us by your power. Direct us by your Spirit so that we may daily grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior until we stand before you in the joy of everlasting glory. This we ask through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.